The third writer highlighted by Penn tonight is Juan Carlos Arginal Medina. Arginal was the owner of a Honduran television station, critical of the government. He was shot and killed by unidentified gunmen in his home two years ago when he was 43. He was the third TV journalist killed in Honduras in 2013. Before his death, he had exposed corruption in a local hospital, including large-scale embezzlement of funds and theft of supplies by a hospital administrator and local political leader. He received death threats before his murder. Arginal was also a member of the opposition political party, Libre. His murder remains unsolved. According to Penn International, at least 54 journalists have been murdered in Honduras since 2003, 48 of them since the coup d'etat in June 2009. Over 90% of these murders remain entirely unsolved. Let us remember Juan Carlos Arginal Medina and all the journalists of Honduras as we listen to Cindywe Magona. Our beloved Cindywe Magona has written autobiography, novels, poetry, short stories, plays, and more than 120 children's books, including 12 books of folk tales. She was awarded the Order of Ikamanga in 2011. Her latest novel, Chasing the Tales of My Father's Cattle, will be launched here on Wednesday by another darling sister with, in conversation with Cindywe. So Cindywe, will you please come up and do what you always do when you embody your speech. <laughs> Good evening. I must start by apologizing. I think I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> I'm sitting here listening to these brilliant writers and my body is aching. I have not been well. Not, not that I'm sick sick. Don't get me wrong, I won't spread anything. <laughs> With all the sad news and bad news and everything, and then to be talking about writers who are imprisoned. The very fact that Penn has made this an annual event made me think it is a sad thing indeed that we can think of writing, writers, and imprisonment. When I look at the three items on our menu, what were they for Newland? Censorship, imprisonment, and freedom of expression. To me, it seems the last one, freedom of uh, expression, comes first. If we were not concerned about that, the other two wouldn't apply. It, uh, freedom of expression is one of the, you know, what I felt I would do, I would try to do, is to just mind, remind ourselves why this is happening and what it means for you and, and, and for, for, for all of us, really. Freedom of expression is one of the fundamental rights and in constitutions of most, almost most countries in the world. Definitely, where there's even a semblance of democracy, where those who rule do so, or are supposed to do so, at the behest of those over whom they rule, or on behalf of those whom they rule. Ordinarily, one wouldn't think of writing as a particularly hazardous occupation, would one? But there you are. Today I read somewhere there are over a million writers worldwide who are imprisoned, some serving, you know, at lifelong sentences. Your whole life you, are in, you have been you know, sent to jail. For what? Because you're right, you didn't kill anybody. Some have simply disappeared. You heard Fenua you know, talk about you know, a 43-year-old who's killed and no trace of somebody being uh, held responsible for that. Many writers in this country and other countries and uh, lots in Africa live in exile. A, 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 um, a writer, for a young writer, well, young, everybody from where I stand is young, from um, Zimbabwe, Chenjerai Hove, died, I think, earlier this year. And the last I heard from the president of that country, Chenjerai was in exile because he felt like it. In other words, he had no reason to run away from home. 
And yes, all that and more, all that grief and more for writing, just for writing, it does make one have a rethink. What is writing? What is freedom of expression? And when and how could the two collide or combine and clash with any kind of law in any country? How does writing and freedom of expression come to collide with a law in any country? Ben Okri said recently that Africa, but this applies elsewhere as well, needs uncomfortable truth sayers. We need people who can speak truth to power. Artists and writers are artists, create. But to create does not mean making something out of nothing. Like the bird needs her nest from leaves and twigs and grass and all sorts of flotsam and jetsam she finds around it. The writer uses bits and pieces of life, of life that abounds all around it. She doesn't manufacture anything that does not exist. She may reimagine it and reconfigure it, but it is already out there. Now I had four writers I wanted to name. In Cameroon, I might mangle their names. There's Diodone Enoch Mayo Mess. Penn believes the charges are politically motivated and he is in, her, in ill health. In China, there's a woman whose name I won't even try to say who's in prison. There are only four. In Iran, another woman, Mavash Sabet, a teacher and a poet because she exposes corruption. She's been jailed for life. In Paraguay, Nelson Aguilera, always a Nelson. 30 months for allegedly plagiarizing a novel. Careful writers. The writer expresses, you know, exercises her right to freedom of expression. And I swear, I write too. Words are no bullets fired from guns. They are not cannons, swords or bombs. When authorities therefore find something objectionable, this happened, when did the guy you read from write? Hundreds of years ago, Oscar Wilde. This has happened throughout the world for, for ages. The persecution of writers, it's nothing new. Books are usually banned and that's bad enough because when a writer's you know, work is banned, that writer suffers emotionally and perhaps financially. But what is our response as the audience, the reading audience? Do we help the jailers of writers by not reading their work, even when it is available? When I read all the things that happened, I must confess I haven't been very active or very uh, observant about what happens elsewhere. But since this call from you, I have made it my business to try and at least write down the names, write down some names. If you do nothing else after tonight, except perhaps write down, even if it's three or five or 10 names, and try to say them aloud. And if you can get the books of these writers, help them not be jailed further than they are already jailed. Keep them out of jail by <coughs> spreading the work they have been jailed for. It's one thing to be jailed, it's another to be allowed to rot in jail because nobody reads you anyway. Then you are more than jailed. Objectionable, that's why books are banned. Objectionable whatever is in their work, that's why the writers are jailed. <coughs> well, you know, a writer has written as, as I said, emotionally and financially, she might suffer. But when she is jailed then, she suffers even more because she loses freedom of movement, freedom of association. She is removed from their world, from her family, friends, colleagues. Now, what happens to those who watch that happen to other writers? Imprisoning writers, is a warning to you and me. 
it affects more than just the person who's been targeted. <clears throat> now we become more careful, we censure ourselves so that the same thing will not happen to us. What is so objectionable in this right that, and by whose standards? Again, I say writers are artists. They create through the words they use. <clears throat> and from time immemorial, writers and bards, before words were reduced to writing even, have often played the vital role of showing society its face, what's and all. They have observed the acts of their fellow human beings and through their pens painted these and held them up to scrutiny. <laughs> See, this is who you are. This is who we are, what we are. Robbed of this wealth when the writer is stopped from writing. Communities, nations, and the whole world in actual fact suffers. Robbed of what would have come from such steeled pens. We are all the poor of the writings of which we are deprived. But there is more than the suffering of that writer, as I said, of the imprisoned writer. The world suffers for being robbed of her, of her art. The cruel treatment of writers signals to other writers and would-be writers that their freedom has bounds, has limits, and that failure to observe these bounds has dire consequences. See what will happen to you. See what happens to writers such as this. We make them rot in jail. Fear is planted in the hearts of others. Such fear that they are mindful of what they do and how they write. Yes, regimes that ruthlessly imprison writers do more than hurt just the sad writers. They implant fear in the hearts of upcoming writers and other writers, of course. They engender a spirit of fearfulness such that the writer begins to censor herself. Creativity is compromised. The mirror the writer holds up to society is false, fake, and the mirror of what it should be, might have been, had there been no censorship and no imprisonment of writers. Writers fearful, write with care, they may not even know they harbor in their hearts. There is a kind of knowing that is just under the skin, a knowing that is unknown and unknowable. It is constant, it is ruthless, it is terribly powerful. The project that is never completed, the project contemplated but never embarked on, the completed project never rings quite true because at some point the writer turned away from what she intended. The world needs truth, candor, it needs honesty to save ourselves from a false sense of security. We need to wake up to what it is we are losing when writers are imprisoned. We need to call these writers by name, call their jailers, the countries <coughs> that commit writers to the living death of prisons. Call these countries by name. They must know we know who they are. They must know we shall let the whole wide world know who they are. When their representatives take the podium at such fora as the General Assembly of the United Nations, for example, we need to be there. I applaud this observance of one day a year, but perhaps more can be done. Remember the women of the Black Sash during apartheid South Africa? They stood there with their sashes, silent, but just by doing that one act, they spoke volumes. The jail writer must never feel alone never be alone in her dungeon, for what she suffers affects us all. Writing is communal, and writers are family, even though national boundaries would tell us otherwise. 
we are one body as writer. A luta continue. Mm -hmm. When I invited Cindy where I knew she was going to be arousing. Um, and I was going to say this at the end, but since I think her speech has um, awakened a conscience or two, there is a clipboard over there if you would like to get sign up for pen to hear about the kind of work they do um, in South Africa and across the world for freedom of expression. The last case of imprisoned writers that I'll highlight tonight comes from Thailand. As you may know, Thailand has a strict law which criminalizes any alleged insult of the royal family. The Les Majeste law is commonly used to silence peaceful dissent. On the 23rd of February this year, a male and female activist, Patiwat Sarayam and Pontrip Mang Kong, were each sentenced to five years in prison, reduced to two and a half, for the crime of staging a play about a fictional monarch, and they did that at Tamasat University. Both young people acted as major characters in the single performance of the play. It was entitled The Wolf's Bride. It dramatized the story of a fictional king and his advisor in a fantasy kingdom. The show was performed only once at the school, <clears throat> but it was recorded and shared on social media. <clears throat> Sarayam and Monkon have not and will not appeal their sentence, according to their lawyers, because they fear further punishment and ill treatment. It is not unusual for people held under les majesté rules in Thailand to commit suicide or die mysteriously of untreated injuries in prison. <clears throat> 